Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's TFAP and Civil Rights Training for the new fiscal year of 2022 to 2023. Uh, the TFAP fiscal year runs October 1st through September 30th, so this is the updated training for all of our partner agencies. So the first part of this training will be TFAP. The following part will be the civil rights training. For the TFAP training, we're going to talk about the history of TFAP, how the program works, what are the different requirements for a partner agency to distribute TFAP appropriately, uh, the way a proper distribution should happen at the moment during this COVID pandemic time and then what it would look like after the pandemic. Uh, we're also going to talk about different storage practices and then what we as well as NCDA looks for when we come to do a site visit. So TPAP is an acronym. It stands for the Emergency Food Assistance Program, which began in 1981. The goal of the program is to reduce inventory of surplus food by distributing it to low income households. The Hunger Prevention Act of 1988 authorized the purchase of additional funds for TVAP. Uh, by USDA, and these additional funds were in addition to any of the surplus food that had already been donated to TFAP by USDA. The Farm Bill of 1990 is the bill that formally named TFAP the Emergency Food Assistance Program. TFAP costs a lot of money each year, but it costs about half a billion dollars in USDA foods each year that's distributed across the country. So different food banks, soup kitchens, and similar partner agencies such as yourself are all different types of organizations that distribute TFAP to the community. TFAP works in a tiered process. So USDA is the organization at the top of the tier. They purchase the product, deal with the cost of processing and packaging, and then make the product available to different state distribution agencies that they partner with. So here in North Carolina, NCDA, which is the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, receives the product from USDA then they make that product available to different partner agencies that they partner with throughout the state. So the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina is one of those partner agencies. So we then receive the product and then store it and then make it available to our different partner agencies who then distribute it directly to the neighbor in need. Now, the amount of food received is based on the number of people or households that are currently receiving FNS benefits. So if a specific county has a higher percentage of individuals who are receiving food stamps, that county is going to receive a higher percentage of TFAP to be allocated to serve that community. Now, each of our TFAP partner organizations have a unique allocation created just for you and that create or that unique allocation is based off of the amount of TFAP that's allocated to your specific county and then we also look at the number of households and individuals that you serve so based on that number you receive a percentage of the county's allocation This is just listing the different food banks within North Carolina that are eligible to distribute TFAP product. USDA also partners directly with soup kitchens to distribute the product as well.
So for the past fiscal year of 2021 to 2022, uh, our food bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina received USDA foods val valued at over just $16 million, which is an incredible feat, but we are not the ones who are on the front line being able to distribute that to the community. It is because of our partnerships with each of our partner agencies that we were able to all distribute this amount of product to the community. We couldn't have done it on our own, so it really is just goes to show that our partnership is serving the community in an incredible amount. As a reminder, TFAP is a supplemental program. So we never would like a neighbor in need to rely solely on TFAP as their primary food source for the month. Um, especially since it is a supplemental program, none of it is guaranteed. Uh, so the product that we are able to distribute to you and then to the neighbors is based on what we receive from NCDA which is what they receive from USDA. So if USDA unfortunately is not able to distribute a specific item, then we're not able to provide that to the neighbors. So the goal is to always have this as a supplemental piece of what they are receiving from your agency as well. There are some requirements for a food item to be considered to be made possible on the TFAP commodity item list. So all of the TFAP commodity items are considered nutritious. The dry goods have an extended, an extended shelf life. Uh, those goods must also be in sufficient quantities for nationwide distribution. So the dry goods that we're here in North Carolina distributing to our neighbors are gonna be the same items that someone in Colorado, or Washington State are also distributing. Ideally, they are also provided in package sizes that are suitable for a household use. So ideally, these are the sizes that you would be able to find in the grocery store. Uh, so for example, maybe one pound bags of rice versus perhaps a 10 pound bag of rice. Now that being said, the way we receive the product is how the product must be distributed to the community. So on the off chance that we receive something in bulk, it needs to be distributed to the community in bulk as well. And then lastly, it depends based on the agricultural market. So we're really lucky to live in an agriculturally rich state here in North Carolina, where we have a wide variety of produce easily available to us, whereas someone who may live in a state where they don't have as much of a variety may not have as much variety to share with their neighbors because it's gonna cost more money to freight the product to them. So this is a list of possibly available TFAP items throughout the year. Not saying that all will be given out at the same exact time, but USDA does a really good job about making different items available to be able to group together and be able to make meals. So for example, fresh canned frozen dried fruits, canned and frozen vegetables, different fruit or vegetable juices, different types of frozen protein, such as chicken, beef, pork, fish, uh, dried beans and lentils, different pasta products, as well as rice and cereal, as well as milk, cheeses, and even eggs. This is a very useful website here. It's from the USDA website itself, and it lists all of the possibly available TFAP items for that fiscal year. So if you ever have a hard time moving a specific item or you have questions about how to make use of this item in a recipe or you don't know how to store it, you can go ahead and access this website here, select the item that you're 
looking for a little bit more knowledge of, and then it will show you the product description, its pack, the yield, storage practices. Uh, if it has any recipes on the USDA website, those will be there. And then it will always show the nutrition and safety information. If you also have any questions about specific items that you'd like recipes for, please email myself so I can touch base with our nutrition team. We do require that all of our food pantries do have a TFAP agreement. So this also works in that tiered process. So USDA requires that all TFAP agencies have a permanent agreement. The agreement is between NCDA and then, uh, so NCDA has an agreement with USDA. The food bank has a permanent agreement with NCDA and then our local TFAP partner agencies have that agreement with the food bank. This agreement is good for one fiscal year. So as I said before, the fiscal year runs October 1st through September 30th. So every September we renew this agreement in preparation for the new fiscal year. So within the TFAP agreement that we have all of our partner agencies sign, it talks about the different pantry operating requirements and record keeping responsibilities. And it talks about the proper way to do a distribution and what we look for when we come to do our site visits. And as a reminder, again, it is renewed annually. All TFAP documents need to be maintained for five calendar years. This can be in a paper copy or an electronic copy, but any TFAP related document must be kept on file for five years. So that can be the TFAP eligibility applications that you use during a distribution, temperature logs, loss report forms, your civil rights uh, training list of everyone who's completed the training. Anything that's related to TFAP must be kept on file for five years. Now, after the five years, you are able to properly dispose of those items. Uh, so, for example, the TFAP eligibility application has confidential information on it, so we would ask that you shred those documents, whereas the temperature logs can just be recycled. As a reminder, participants do not need to be a U.S. citizen to receive TFAP commodities. TFAP is a self-declaring program, so if a neighbor in need uh, declares that they are eligible, then they would be able to receive the product. We are not allowed to ask for any form of identification, social security numbers, EBT cards, proof of income or proof of residency to qualify an individual for TFAP. We are taking their word and hoping that they are being truthful. So it falls back on them. Just as any other food pantry, TFAP agencies are required to turn in their TFAP monthly reports to the food bank by the first of every month. They are considered late after the fifth. If you are missing any monthly reports, your food pantry will be placed on suspension status. And while on suspension, you will not have access to any food bank product. So please make sure that you turn in your monthly reports on a timely manner. If you are missing more than two reports, your agency is at risk of being removed from the TFAP program. Before we remove an agency from the TFAP program, though, there will be a lot of communication, so it will never be a surprise. If by chance you did not distribute TFAP during a given month, 
you still need to enter a monthly report. You would just enter zeros, which would indicate to the food bank that you did not distribute TFAP product. Uh, if you do not distribute TFAP during a given month, please let the food bank know. And if you did not distribute TFAP for two or more consecutive months, and you have not let the food bank know that this was go going to be happening, your agency will be at risk of being removed from the program. Now, if you know that your agency will need to be closed due to renovations, for example, please let the food bank know. We'll put a pause on your TFAP at that time, and then when the renovations are done and you're ready to reopen, let us know and then we can resume. So communication is key. We want to make sure that we are understanding and helping you as much as possible. So how do people qualify for TFAP? So if an individual or a household is currently receiving FNS benefits, also known as food stamps, they would automatically be uh, eligible to receive TFAP. If by chance they're not receiving FNS benefits, if their income is at or below the income poverty guidelines based on their household size and income, then they would qualify that way. All of our food pantries uh, that distribute TFAP must use the currently approved uh, TFAP eligibility application form. If you would like to change that form and edit it to fit your agency a little bit better based on your needs, you need to seek approval from the food bank before you begin using that document at a distribution. And really that's so we can make sure that we get the approval from NCDA. Everything on the form is acceptable. Nothing on that form is going to make someone think that they have to share any information that's not a requirement with them or with the pantry before receiving product. So just let us know and then we'll get back to you as quickly as possible. So for example, uh, in April and October, when we do ask for demographic information during monthly reports, that information is not allowed to be documented on the TFAP eligibility application form because those are not requirements or prerequisites to determine if someone qualifies for TFAP or not. So during those months, you would just document that information on a separate form. Also, we don't want to tie that information back to any specific individual, so it doesn't have to be on their application. This is the updated income guideline chart for eligibility. So this is what you will help you determine if someone does or does not qualify. You would ask what their household size is and then go across to determine if they are at or below those income levels. Agencies are not permitted to impose any additional qualifications or conditions of any kind that would preclude an otherwise eligible person from receiving TFAP food. So this includes requiring that a participant show their ID card, proof of income, proof of residency, and so forth. As before, if you are caught doing this, your agency is at risk of being removed from the program. But once again, there's going to be a lot of communication that happens before that were to become active. All right, so quickly looking at this sign here, is this pantry in compliance with TFAP regulations? Now, seeing as we're not allowed to ask for proof of income or photo ID and an agency referral is not a requirement, this sign should only state emergency food assistance because appointments are not a requirement either. Um, you may receive someone as a referral from another organization, but really the sign should only say emergency food assistance.
So this is the part that gets a little tricky for some partner agencies. Food pantries are allowed to ask for identification or other personal information for the distribution of their privately donated food or for financial assistance. But it needs to be made very clear that it's not a requirement as a prerequisite for the participant to receive TFAT credit. So if you are found asking for someone's ID card or personal information and it's linked back to them receiving TFAT food, you will be uh, found not in compliance and be at risk of being removed from the program. So the statement down here in yellow, I understand that any misrepresentation of need, sale, or misuse of the foods that I have received is prohibited and could result in a fine, imprisonment, or both. So that statement is on the TFAP eligibility application that you are using during your distribution process. And when the participant signs to receive their TFAP product, uh, they are acknowledging that statement, which puts all of the liability on the participant if they were to be found guilty for misuse of the product. So it takes liability away from you as the partner agency. So for the TFAP application process being continued, TFAP pantries are allowed to supplement TFAP distributions with privately donated food. So this is just stating that if you have other product at your agency, you're allowed to distribute that at the same time that you distribute your TFAP goods, or if when your TFAP goods begin to deplete, if you have those items in your privately donated goods, you're then allowed to supplement that in place to keep everything as equal as possible. This is a great question right here. Can two different applicants that reside at the same street address receive TFAP foods as separate households? Yes, they definitely can. It just needs to be made very clear that the two households are living as separate economic units. So for example, if two people are living at the same street address, and they buy their own groceries, make their own meals, and eat those separately, and then pay all of their bills on their own, and they don't share any of that responsibility with anyone else at that address, then they would be a separate economic unit. Whereas a married couple shares their income, buys groceries together, makes meals and eats together, that would be considered one economic unit, so uh, they would not be considered separate. If by chance an individual is refused TFAP foods, the agency must document why the client was refused to then keep that information on file for five years. So if an individual does not qualify for TFAP, that does not mean that they're being refused the food. Um, unfortunately, they do not qualify, which is why they would not receive it. Uh, this here is more so talking about if someone is disrespecting and not following your pantry guidelines that you should all have posted. And for example, if you have must be treating staff and volunteers and others with respect or they don't use um, foul language, or by chance maybe you don't serve someone if they're in an intoxicated state. Any of those would be examples of pantry guidelines that someone may be not following, and you should try to resolve the issue, but if you can't come to a resolved situation, then you would be able to refuse to eat that food. I would always suggest that when you're refusing product to someone, always welcome them back whenever the situation changes, but also try to refer them or let them know about a nearby agency that they can go try to receive food assistance from as well.
Participants are not to be charged a fee or be required to provide services in exchange for food. And agencies are not to require clients to pray or worship as a condition for receiving food. However, you are allowed to invite clients to stay after a food distribution for religious services or other messages. All religious-based organizations must display the written notice of beneficiary of rights poster. This can be found in the TFAP agency packet and you would fill out the top part with your agency's information and then the bottom portion of that poster is where you would indicate a nearby non-religious organization that someone can access product from if they choose not to associate with your religious-based organization. Um, as an agency, you are not allowed to require anyone to pray as it says. Um, so that being said, you're not allowed to gather everyone as a large group and do a large prayer prior to a distribution. Uh, if you would like to do a prayer before a distribution begins, you can gather your staff and volunteers and then go off to the side or into a different room away from the participants. That way it's made very clear that it's not a condition for them to receive food. Uh, now, if by chance a participant asks for you to pray with them as they are receiving product, since the participant is the one who initiated that conversation, then you would be allowed to do so at that time because they were the ones to initiate that. All right, so before we get to what the paper documentation looks like for a distribution, I just wanna throw out a fun fact that Fall is my favorite season of the year. I love to see the colors change and just the crisp air. Uh, so I'm really excited for this weather right now that we're having. Okay, so moving along. Uh, for the TFAP eligibility application form during the pandemic, uh, this form should look very familiar to everyone. So the left side of the form here, you will put your agency information and then the center section right here where it says agency representative signature is your intake worker um, signature. So whoever your staff or volunteer person is that is collecting this information, their signature goes on that front page and then that signature counts as the signature for all of the households that doc are documented as receiving product during that distribution day. Now this, the right side is where you're going to document that information for each household. So you're going to collect their name, their address, do they receive FNS benefits? If they say yes, then you do not need to enter a monthly income. However, if they say no, you do need to enter a monthly income and the chart is off on the side here, so it's easy to reference. And then we do ask that you document the number of the household. And then if they have a proxy, which is someone to come pick up product for them when this client is not able to be there physically, then you would write in that proxy's name in this space here. And when you're using this form specifically, you need to receive a letter from the proxy every time that they come to pick up product that authorizes them permission to do so for the participant that they're picking up for. So this is just a little bit of a larger view here. Um, so showing that the name, yes or no, income. Now, if they say no, uh, they don't have an income, you would write zero in that space. So this is what the post-COVID or post-pandemic form 
will be. Um, so if you have transitioned to being back in person, allowing participants to enter your agency, then you can transi transition back to using this form, which is what the traditional form was prior to the pandemic. So the participant's name and information will go at the top here. You'll be able to reference the income guideline chart right here. So you would reference that. And then towards the bottom, this is where you, the participant is able to indicate two people as a proxy. So if they indicate and write the name in of two people that they authorize to be a proxy, the proxy will not be required to bring a letter every single time, only if they're using this form here. And then this signature on the front page is to authorize those proxies. Otherwise, there's no need for a signature on the front page. The back side here will be signed by the participant every time that they receive TFAP product. So that's where you get to write the date. They sign under client signature. We're going to collect the information. Do they receive FNS benefits? As before, if they say yes, you do not need to document an income here. However, if they say no, then you do need to document an income. And then an agency representative needs to sign stating that they received product every single time when you use this form. And then this is another form. So this is a single use application. So it's only got one page, this one front page here. So it would collect the participant's information at the top here. And then the agency representative signature will go in the center here. And then the, the participant will sign right here. So this is not in the TFAP agency packet. Um, we just try to make things as simple as possible, um, save some trees in the process. But if this is a form that would benefit your agency for a distribution, please let me know and I can make that available to you. Agency personnel are allowed to assist clients that have difficulty writing, but the client must personally sign or mark the uh, TFAP eligibility application form, acknowledging the information is correct. So marking it can be indicated by their signature or even signing an X. And then the witness by, it needs to be witnessed by the intake worker. All right, so this is talking about the uh, proxy once again. So this is on the post COVID-19 TFAP eligibility form. So this would be on that front page a little bit lower. Um, if you are using the um, current uh, COVID-19 pandemic TFAP application, so the mobile TFAP one, you do need to receive a letter every time that someone comes as a proxy. The proxy a template letter is included in the updated TFAP eligibility application or the updated TFAP agency packet. TFAP food must be provided to clients on a first come, first serve basis, and all clients must be treated equally and fairly. All TFAP items need to have a distribution rate set. So this is the most important part of your distribution. Uh, a lot of agencies, I understand, don't like this because it does involve math, but it's the most important part because you get to determine the maximum amount of each item you can distribute to a household. So you're amplifying the amount of product you're able to distribute to the community equally. 
And then it also allows for you to be able to clear out and distribute all of the product from your storage to make room for your next month's allocation. So once you set your distribution rate for each item, it is not allowed to change for that entire month. So when you set it at the beginning of the month, make it very clear to all staff and volunteers what that distribution rate is for each item. So all of the boxes or bags are prepared equally. And then when the next month comes and you receive a new allocation, then you can reset the distribution rates. So we'll go through a quick example just to make sure that everyone understands how to set a distribution rate. So for this example, we are going to be using frozen fish as our item. So the frozen fish come packaged 22 pound packages of fish to one case. Uh, this Agency here received 11 cases of frozen fish. So we want to determine how many packages would be possible to distribute to the households. So we will do 11 times 20, which comes to 220 packages of fish available for distribution. So now we want to determine the average number of households you serve each month. So for this example, this agency distributes to about 100 households each month. So you will then do 220 divided by 100, which then comes out to two. <coughs> uh, which comes to two packages of fish to be able to serve to each household but then there's gonna be 20 packages left over. So what do you think we are going to do with those 20 packages of fish? So you are going to safely and securely store those 20 extra packages of fish until the next day of distribution, or if someone happens to come on a non-distribution day searching for emergency food assistance, um, if they are eligible for TPOP, then you're able to distribute that product to them just as if you would during a distribution, but you do need to document that they received product, filling out the TPOP eligibility application form. So as a reminder, you are not to change the distribution rate once it has been established at the beginning of the month, and you are not allowed to give participants extras of remaining TFAP food because some other food items have run out. In this situation, pantries are allowed to supplement with their privately donated food. Pantries do have the option of providing more food to larger households or larger families, but the distribution rate needs to be pre-established and stay the same. So once again, just make sure that it's staying equal throughout the month. Um, so for example, when you set your distribution rate and you build your box or bag, whatever that total box equals, maybe that is enough for a household size one to four individuals. So if a vehicle is coming through your mobile distribution line, if they have three individuals in their household, then they would receive one box of product that you've prepared. And then they sign the form, they go on with their day, the next vehicle drives up, if they have seven individuals in their household, then they would receive two boxes of TFAP goods and so forth. Um, that way you didn't get to pick and choose which items they received more of. They just equally across the board received additional product, but the distribution rate stayed the same. You are able to combine like items to extend that product's distribution. 
So for example, fruit juices, you're allowed to combine those together. So if by chance you had received three different flavors of fruit juice, instead of distributing one of each flavor to a household, you're allowed to combine those juices together to set your distribution rate. And then let's say the distribution rate was one. So they would receive one juice. And then let's say you start serving orange juice. You serve orange juice to all of the households that qualify. Once orange juice runs out, then you move on to cranberry. Once cranberry runs out, then you move on to apple, for example. You're also allowed to do this with your frozen proteins. Uh, you're not allowed to combine all frozen protein into one item. You must do like items. So all frozen chicken is allowed to be combined to one item and then frozen beef into one, frozen pork into one, and then frozen fish all as their own different categories. Now, when you are setting your distribution rate, you're setting it based on the number of items to distribute. It's not based on weight. So if you combined all of your frozen chicken together, maybe you have whole chickens to distribute as well as chicken breasts. Based on whatever distribution rate you have, perhaps it's one, you would start by distributing all of the whole chickens. And then when that item runs out, then you would move on to the next type of frozen chicken item and serve that until it's out and then continue with that. You must make all items available a minimum of one while supplies last. So if you have the combination of different frozen chicken, frozen pork, frozen beef, and frozen fish, you need to make one of each of those items available to participants while you have that in supply. As a reminder, <coughs> participants must be served on a first come first serve basis and households or individuals are allowed to receive TFAP more than once per month. Uh, it is a first come first serve basis, so if they come multiple times throughout the month, then they are able to receive that product. They are also allowed to go to multiple locations throughout the month, um, so there's no set limit on that for anyone. Some practices that we do our best to avoid doing include saving larger items, for larger families. So when you pre-box or pre-bag the product, the way the next box that comes through is gonna be the next box that goes to the next household. You cannot pick and choose items to uniquely create a TFAP box or bag for larger families. You're also not allowed to alter the package size to extend distribution. So for example, if an item is received in a bulk size, then you must distribute that item in bulk size. Unfortunately, that comes from USDA that way. So the way we receive it is the way you must distribute it as well. You're also not allowed to hold back certain TFAP items for different distribution days. So, for example, if you grouped like items together for frozen fruit, let's say you had frozen blueberries and frozen strawberries, you're not allowed to say, well, today we're only serving frozen blueberries and when they run out, they run out. And then the next week you're serving frozen strawberries. Um, when you combine those items together as one item to extend the distribution, when the TFAP blueberries run out, you just roll right in to start using the strawberries until those items no longer exist. Uh, you're not allowed to change the distribution rate once it has been stated and started at the beginning of the month. 
And then you're not allowed to hold back certain uh, USDA foods that are in limited supply for volunteers. So it's great if a volunteer qualifies for TFAP. Uh, they, one, are not allowed to be served first because you don't want to show favoritism for the volunteer. Um, they would need to cycle through the distribution just as any other client would to receive their product. If they're not able to leave their volunteer station during a distribution, they are able to send a proxy through to receive product for them. That way they can continue volunteering throughout the distribution and then that proxy would be able to go through the distribution and receive product for them. Previously frozen meats and other foods obtained through the retail recovery programs are allowed to supplement their TFAP distribution, but it cannot be a substitution for USDA food while USDA food is still available for distribution. So if you participate in the retail, retail recovery program and you receive some frozen meats from Food Lion, for example, you're allowed to serve your TFAP distribution and then you can also serve the meats that you received from Food Lion at the same time. Uh, now, the a practice you're not allowed to do is say, oh, for example, you received frozen chicken. You can't say, well, I like this frozen chicken better that I got from Food Lion, so I'm going to serve all of this chicken first because I like it more, and then when that product runs out, then start serving your TFAP product. Unfortunately, it's you serve them both at the same time or you wait until TFAP has been depleted and then you can start serving the retail product. Can a participant go to multiple TFAP sites? Yes, they definitely can. There is no law that limits a family from obtaining TFAP food from only one location. So I know that participants will figure out where the other agencies are that distribute TFAP, and that's perfectly okay. We do not get to police who does and does not receive TFAP product. If they, if they qualify for a TFAP and you have TFAP products still available, then they would be able to receive that product. When you provide TFAP food to out of county residents, yes, you definitely can. Participants should be encouraged to seek a TFAP pantry within their county of residence. However, we do understand that sometimes a TFAP pantry in adjacent county is the closer site to that um, participant. So if that is the situation, then the participant can definitely continue receiving product from that food pantry as long as they are a North Carolina resident. So the product is allocated specifically to the county that your agency is located, but you are able to serve anyone as long as they're a North Carolina resident. USDA has set strict uh, temperature ranges for the um, storage of USDA product. So any frozen product needs to be kept in a freezer set at zero degrees or colder. Refrigerated items need to be kept in a cooler set at 35 to 39 degrees. And then dry storage should be kept ideally between 50 and 70 degrees. I understand that can be a little challenging during the summer months here in North Carolina, but please do your best to keep it within those temperature ranges. It is a requirement to document the temperature seven out of seven days a week while you have TFAP product in storage. So for example, if you receive your product on a Tuesday, then you're going to 
automatically start monitoring and documenting your temperatures on that Tuesday and every day leading up until your distribution. Now, if you distribute all of your product at your distribution, technically you do not need to document and monitor your temperatures until you receive TFAP once again. Now, it is highly encouraged to continue documenting your temperatures for your storage units throughout the month, just to make sure that they are functioning properly. Now, if you did not distribute all of your product at that distribution, then you are required to document and monitor that temperature every day until you no longer have product in storage. When you're checking your cold storage temperatures, you are required to have a thermometer on the inside of the cold storage unit and document based off of that thermometer's temperature. I understand some partner agencies might have a newer freezer or refrigerator that has a digital thermometer on the outside, but we always want to make sure that there's one on the inside as well. So if you need thermometers, please reach out and let myself know. We would be happy to provide those for you. We also understand that being physically at your location every day while, while you have product in storage can be very challenging. So USDA has actually uh, agreed that wireless thermometers will be allowed to be used. So this would be one of those remote temperature monitoring devices. It would be going on the inside of the cold storage unit, and then it syncs up with an app, whether that be on your phone or a tablet, so you can remotely monitor the temperatures and then document those on the temperature log chart and you get to set the temperature parameters within the app as well. It's also recommended that storage areas be kept clean, neat, organized, and secure. And USDA <laughs> or NCDA um, recommends that having a regular pest control service by an authorized licensed agency um, be conducting services at your agency. The food bank does require this every six months. So this should already be in practice for you. If you have an agency come out and service your agency more frequently than once every six months, that is great as well. Food should be stacked on pallets or shelving with a minimum of six inches off the walls and the floor, or at least a pallet height off the ground, and then ideally two feet from the ceiling. So this allows for proper ventilation and then easy access to clean around these items. And then food should also be stored so that foods with the oldest packing dates or the best if used by dates are in front and used first. This allows you to follow the first in, first out storage practices. That way, no item should ever reach its expiration date um, on your shelves. It should all be distributed before then. If by chance food is taken out of its original case or loses its label, um, go ahead and use a permanent marker and write on for example, the can, um, what the item is, and then their best if used by date. So you know what you're distributing and make sure that it is distributed um, with your first and first out practices, but also so the participant knows what they are receiving as well. If by chance you have a loss of product, um, please complete the loss of loss report form, which is found in your TFAP agency packet. You will keep that on file for five years, but please also share a copy with myself at the food bank so we can keep record as well. 
And this can be a variety of different reasons. Uh, perhaps produce spoiled before you were able to distribute all of that at a distribution. Uh, maybe pallets were stacked incorrectly where something heavier was stacked on top of a lighter item. Or perhaps maybe your cold storage unit lost power and everything went out of the safe temperature ranges. So please document all of that and share a copy with me whenever this does happen. Now, agencies that experience loss exceeding more than $500 and it's found due to negligence may be responsible for paying back the value of that food. Um, so this is when you keep uh, your temperature log chart updated um, just in case you do have a power outage, for example, and you lose all the product in there. At least you can show proof that you've been um, keeping records regularly, and then that would probably prevent it from being negligent. So this is a training that is done annually. This is done in preparation for the new fiscal year. Uh, ideally, it is done every September, um, but this is the recorded training, so you're able to access and share this, this training um, for any staff and volunteers throughout the year. Um, so uh, <coughs> the next part of this training is the civil rights training. So any staff or volunteer who have direct contact with TFAP participants must complete the civil rights training. And the final part of this training here is talking about our site visits. So when NCDA or the food bank come and visit your location, we're gonna be looking at the participant applications, learning how your distribution procedures are and possibly viewing a distribution, as well as reviewing your storage practices. And then we will also be looking for the roster of who has completed the civil rights training at your agency. So that's a document you'll keep on file for five years, but you also have to share that copy with the food bank as well for our records. So this is a map of the NCDA field representatives. So for our food bank's service area, Jan Holt and Tanya Durfler are our representatives that service our food pantries. Right, so that is the end of the TFAP portion. We are going to go right into the civil rights aspect now. So once again, this is required for any individual, whether that be a staff or volunteer, who have direct contact with TFAP participants. Um, the record of completion training document, um, so you can list who's completed this, is available on Food Link. This is the website that you can access the uh, civil rights training online. So you are able to email that out to staff and volunteers for them to review on their own time if they do not review it prior to um, showing up to volunteer at a distribution. So what are civil rights? So civil rights are defined as the non-political rights of a citizen, the rights of personal liberty guaranteed to U.S citizens by the 13th and 14th amendments to the U.S. Constitution and by acts of Congress. The FSN, FNS Instruction 113-1 establishes and conveys policy, provides guidance and direction, as well as ensures compliance and prohibits discrimination.
Discrimination is defined as to unfairly treat a person or group of people differently from people or groups. These are the different topics that we are going to cover in this training. So to begin with, we are starting with collection and use of data. So state and local agencies are required to obtain data by race and ethnicity. Self-identification or self-reporting from the participant is the preferred method of obtaining this information. Participants are not required to give this information though. So if by chance they do not do that, then the intake worker um, should visually observe and secure and document this information to their best ability at that point. Effective public notification systems. The purpose of the public notification system is to inform applicants, current participants, and potential eligible people that you offer TFAP programming. Uh, if there is a complaint, you have a complaint form, and then also having the non-discrimination statement visibly posted. So that is located on the Injustice for All poster. So anyone alleging to file a complaint has 180 days since the date of alleged discriminatory action to file this complaint. So that's a long time. That's about six months that an individual can have to file their specific complaint. And they can file this by writing up a formal written complaint letter, like filling out a form, writing a letter, or they can also verbally give you this complaint. And in that situation, then it is your responsibility to, com to complete filling out one of these complaint forms. So whether that be a verbal complaint or a written complaint, you want to document as much as possible to have everything in one generalized space. So you want to get all of their contact information, name, address, phone, email, and so forth. You want to be very specific about the location that this discriminatory action allegedly happened, and then the name of the agency. You want to document the nature of the incident and then why they feel that they are being discriminated. And then you always want to make sure that you also document the date to make sure that it is within those 180 days. This flowchart is very long and confusing, but just remember that when you do receive a complaint, let the food bank know so we can help you resolve that situation. Um, once again, it's a partnership between us, so we want to help you succeed as much as possible and want to show you that we're there and are able to support you. Compliance reviews. So this is when we come out and do a site visit, if we find something that would deem you non-compliant, um, we must give you actual writing. We have to let you know in writing what those are. And then when we let you know what those are, we'll also give you a recommendation on how to resolve those situations. And when we come to do a site visit, it could be from unusual fluctuations of racial or ethnic groups in a service area. Um, perhaps there's a number of discrimination complaints filed against your agency that we have yielded at the food bank level or NCDA's level. Uh, it could be a follow-up site visit from a previous meeting, or it could be information from grassroots organizations, state officials, and so forth.
So the resolution of non-compliance would be one, the factual finding that a civil rights requirement is not being adhered to. So if found non-compliant, uh, we at the food bank would give immediate steps to become compliant once again. So that would be, we would give you a letter stating what we found as non-compliant and then list suggestions on how to resolve those situations. Now, if you do not try to resolve any of those situations, um, then your agency may be placed on suspension. If your agency is on suspension for six months, then you are at risk of being terminated from the food bank. But once again, there's going to be a lot of communication that happens prior to that ever happening. These are the different protected classes that someone may feel discriminated against. So race, age, color, disability, national origin, religion, or political affiliation. This is the full non-discrimination statement from USDA, which is summed up to stating that USDA is an equal opportunity provider and employer. Requirements for reasonable accommodation of people with disabilities. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 prohibits discrimination and ensures equal opportunity for people with disabilities in, in employment, state and local government services, public accommodations, commercial facilities, and transportation. This is the Injustice for All poster. Everyone should have one of these visibly posted during a distribution for all participants to see. Uh, if you do not have one of these, you are able to access this from the USDA website and print a copy off. I have ordered more, and when those arrive, I will be able to distribute those to all agencies. Requirements for language assistance. So the Title VI and its regula regulations require state agencies, local agencies, and other subrecipients to take reasonable steps to ensure meaningful access to information and services that you provide. So what factors should be considered to determine what constitutes reasonable steps? So one, the number or proportion of limited English proficiency people eligible to receive or be served or likely to be encountered by the program. Number two, the frequency with which limited English proficiency comes in contact with the program. Number three, the nature and importance of the program activity or service provided by the program to the people's lives. And then lastly, the resources available to the recipient. USDA. Uh, is an equal opportunity provider, so equal opportunity for religious organizations. This ensures a level playing field for the participation of faith-based organizations as well as other community organizations to participate and distribute USDA goods. Faith-based organizations are able to use the space in their facilities to provide USDA-funded service without removing religious art, icons, scriptures, or other religious symbols, and ensuring that no organization receives direct financial assistance from USDA can be discriminated against or program beneficiary on the basis of religion or religious belief. As a reminder, all religious organizations need to have the written notice of beneficiary of rights poster hung and visible during all distributions. So this is what that looks like. As I had told before, your agency information will go in the top here. And then this 
space in the bottom is where you would indicate a nearby non-religious partner agency. Conflict resolution. So this refers to resolving the dispute of to the approval of one or both parties. So the goal is to enter the process with an open mind, do your best not to prejudge others, and try not to overreact. I love this statement. Attack the problem, not the person, and listen to understand the problem. Sometimes, many times, we listen to react because we have a statement that we want to make sure that someone hears. So most times we're listening and then the moment someone stops is so we can react and share what we're thinking rather than slowing down, listening to what they have to say and then responding to them. Customer service. We all work in a customer service field. So as a reminder, be professional and courteous. Listen intently and take notes if necessary. Repeat back what you've been told to ensure correctness, to make sure that you understood what they were saying. It could just be a mix up between just two words that could cause uh, a complaint. Uh, if by chance you need corrective action, then follow up with that. And then remember you are providing a service. I understand that Many times participants do not say thank you enough, um, but I'm saying thank you. It is a partnership that we have and we couldn't do it without you. So thank you so much. These are just some questions to think about, to discuss with your um, staff and volunteers at your agency. So does your team care about the participants as people? Do you understand the participant's point of view? Are you serving the participant's human and business needs? Are you treating everyone with respect? Are you offering helpful information and assistance? Whatever you're doing to offer assistance for your neighbors in need, make it matter. Uh, emphasize and listen to the customer's concerns. And are you responding with reliable services? Okay, so we're gonna walk through a quick little review of the civil rights to test your knowledge. So where does the statement USDA is an equal opportunity provider and employer need to be included? That is on any documentation that you're distributing to neighbors um, during a TFAP distribution, but that statement specifically is on the Injustice for All poster. A TFAP pantry is not accessible to people in wheelchairs. What are some possible corrective actions? So you would be able to possibly designate a parking spot. That way, when this individual arrives to your agency, they could possibly park at that special designated parking spot and someone would bring food out to them. If you have the funds, you can install a ramp into your agency. Uh, there's a variety of different options there. The food pantry received a complaint from a man who claims he is handicapped and cannot walk up the five stairs to the pantry. He wants them to deliver the food to his house. Now the pantry designated a handicapped parking spot at the entrance and hung a sign noting that they can honk and food would be brought out to those individuals. The man still insisted they deliver the food to his house or else he will file a complaint. Well, the agency did make reasonable accommodations for individuals um, who are not able to walk upstairs. Um, so the fact that they made those reasonable accommodations puts them in the safe zone. We never require an agency to offer delivery. Um, so this 
participant can go ahead and file a complaint if they want, but the agency did what they were supposed to do. A pantry manager designates Wednesday as Senior Citizens Day. She allows all the people over the age of 65 to move to the front of the distribution line. Is this an allowable practice? Unfortunately, it's not. So this is age discrimination. Uh, TFAP is a first come first serve program, so you cannot pick and choose who receives product first. Food Bank received a complaint that a pantry volunteer who was conducting a screening for eligibility to receive TFAP food asked a woman the following questions. Her name, address, etc. and are you registered to vote? She then asked, will you be voting for John Smith for public office? When the participant answered no, the volunteer stated that she did not qualify to receive any TFAP food at that time. The applicant believes she did not receive food since she was not voting for Mr. Smith. However, she did meet the eligibility criteria. So this volunteer asked more questions than there were requirements for to receive TFAP product. Um, and also the individual felt discriminated based on their political views. So the volunteer needs to go back and redo their training and learn what they are or are not allowed to do. So essentially the participant should have received product. What are some good ways to publicize the availability of the TFAP program to people who may be eligible and benefit from receiving USDA foods? So essentially, how are you gonna make this known to the community that you offer TFAP? So, you can make flyers and hand those out to individuals. There could be a poster in your agency window, yard signs, utilize social media, or even the local newspaper, or even word of mouth. Those are all wonderful ways. The pantry that distributes TFAP food places religious literature in the food packages. Is this allowable under the faith-based rules that prohibit discrimination against religious institutions? So unfortunately, you're not allowed to place any type of pamphlet or religious article in with the TFAP product. So the best way to move forward with this situation is to have a table at the end of your distribution and let it be client choice. So they can come up and grab whatever uh, letters or pamphlets that they wish, and then they can move along with their day. That way it's not being forced upon them. A local church contacts you before the holidays and asks for a list of Burmese people who are receiving, a list of the Burmese people who are currently receiving your services so that their outreach ministry can contact them. What civil rights issues does this pose and how should it be handled? You're not able to share out this confidentiality information for your participants that you are serving, nor would you ever single out a specific group of individuals. So the best way to go about this is to let that organization know that you serve so many people on average each month and if they're willing to still serve all of those individuals together. All right, so that is the end of the civil rights training. I'm going to share the information for our NCDA field representatives. So this is Tanya and Jan's contact information. When they come out to do a site visit at your locations, they always call and let you know and organize with you when that will be. So they will not be showing up and surprising you. And then my contact information is here as well. So now that you have completed this training, please reach out to myself via email 
and request the post training quiz that you must complete. So each agency is required to complete this annual training. So please reach out via email now to request that post quiz to make sure that you did in fact complete this training to its entirety. All right, thank you so much. And I appreciate all of the partnership that you do with us and for serving those in need. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.